they've given me an impossible task in that they've given me the title male roles being a husband, a father, a son, a brother in 45 minutes. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, not, I'm being serious. You could take each one of those and give it 45 minutes. So what I've done is I've prepared a handout. Okay, if you like handout, you're in for a treat. And that'll do a lot of my talking for me. And what I thought I would do is literally speak for about 15, 20 minutes maximum. And then I hope there will be discussion. Okay, and we can tease out some of those points. If there's no discussion, there must be a pub nearby that we can all go to before the next session starts. But let's hope that there is discussion. Right. <laughs> or discussion at the pub. <laughs> oh, I should be careful what I should, I'm saying. This is being recorded, you know. Where are all the people from that? Right, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that as men, you've brought us together. And we thank you, Lord, that we do indeed have a role to play in the plans and purposes of God. You've created us as men. You've given us a certain identity, a certain gender, and you've given us certain roles. And our Father, this afternoon, we want to explore those roles. We want to do it to the glory of Jesus Christ. We want to look at everything for this one goal, that Christ might be honored and glorified and worshipped in our midst. And so, Father, as we look at the Bible, we look at certain verses, and we look at the teaching of the Bible, would you, Lord, bless us? Would you guide us? We pray that our discussion would be lively. We pray that all would contribute. We pray it would be helpful. We pray, Lord, that we would all, every one of us, we would learn something from this discussion today. And we pray, Lord, above all, that we would become more like Jesus and more uh, better children of God as a result of our session today. So would you bless us by your spirit? Would you come to us this afternoon? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Very, very brief uh, introduction. My name is Sukesh uh, and I'm an Indian by origin. But I was born and raised in Africa, in Kenya. Um, you may know that uh, in the Victorian times, a large number of Indians moved from India to East Africa. And my great-grandparents moved to East Africa. So I'm a third generation Kenyan Asian. Uh, I first came to this country to do university. I did a degree in history. and. Um, intended to go straight back, but I became a Christian and ended up staying a little time, got married here, actually got married in Bristol, and then uh, went back to Nairobi. Uh, I trained for the ministry and then trained back, went back to Nairobi, and I was a pastor of a church in Nairobi for many, many years. Uh, I also did other work. Uh, I looked after a Bible college. They didn't have a principal. So for a little time, uh, I, I have a master's degree in theology, so I, I was principal of a Bible college. I edited a theological journal, and uh, this is going to sound like a terrible show-off. I promise you it isn't, but I've translated 42 books into Swahili from English because we didn't have any books in Swahili, and the Kenyan pastors needed books in Swahili. So I translated books into Swahili. Now that's something I still do. I still translate books into Swahili. I'm currently a pastor in Clevedon. Uh, if you haven't seen Clevedon, you haven't lived, right? Uh, it's it's the end of the it's at the center of the universe. It's it's a it's a beautiful town actually. It's a very very beautiful town, and uh, our church is right on the seafront. And uh, I came back from Kenya. Uh, eight years ago because my wife was white English. She wanted to come back home. My children were starting university. They wanted to come to Britain. And a year after we returned, my wife died. She had cancer and died of that. So I've been back since then debating, should I go back to Kenya or remain? My children have settled here now, and they tell me that they would like me to remain. My children, three children, are all Christians. My oldest son is a pastor in London. 
and then I have twins, a boy and a girl in Cambridge, in secular work but fully involved in the life of a local church. Right, the subject is uh, male roles being a husband, a father, a son, a brother, a friend, okay? Uh, if you can take one and pass the rest around, thank you. Let me just get some water. I should have just mentioned I was actually born and raised a Hindu and became a Christian in my early 20s. What I want to do is to explore the person of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is our example in everything, okay? He is our role model. And I want us to examine three relationships. And as we examine those three relationships, we will see Christ as our example. So I want to examine, first of all, the relationship that we as individuals have with Jesus Christ. And then secondly, I want to examine the relationship that Christ has with the church, okay? Not with individual Christians, but with his body, the church. And then thirdly, I want to examine the relationship that Christ has with his Father. Now you can see why I'm saying that I've been given an impossible task, because uh, when you study theology, those are the sort of central things, particularly the Father and the Son, and they spend hours and hours and hours in lectures teaching you this stuff. But I thought as we examine those three relationships, what will emerge is Christ our example in each case. Okay, so firstly then, I've got the Christ, our brother or our friend, and therefore our role model in how we can be brothers, friends to each other. You're in a relationship with a member of the church, uh, you, you are friends with that person, you're a brother. How do you operate that relationship? Well, the text for my first point is Mark chapter 3, verses 34 to 35. And it says there, then he looked at those seated in a circle around him. These were his disciples. These were his followers, okay? He looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So Christ calls us brothers. He says, if you are a Christian, you love the Lord Jesus, you're a child of God, he says, you're my brother. This is not the only text in the Bible that speaks about Christ being our brother. There's a passage in Hebrews where he says he is not ashamed to call them brothers because he came as a human being and relates to us. Now what I've done for each one is brought out a few points just to give us some idea of how that relationship works. How does your relationship with Jesus Christ as your brother, how does it work? Well, two things. Firstly, he loves you unconditionally. Jesus' love for you will never be conditional upon your behavior. Okay? Uh, I have to be careful what I say, but I will say this, it's controversial. If you go out of this place and commit a totally dreadful sin, a totally, totally dreadful sin, the love of Christ for you does not change. He will love you as much as he does today, as he does the day that you become a Christian. In the Bible, the, the, the adjective abundant is often used for God's love for us. He loves us with an abundant love. Okay? And for you as a Christian, Jesus' heart has only one thing in it. Love. There is no disappointment, there is no rejection, there is no anger, there is no bitterness, there is no disapproval. Never ever think that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Oh, oh for goodness sake, he's failed again. Never think like that. He's not like that. 
He is gracious, He is kind, He is compassionate, He is merciful, He is loving, and that is all He is towards you as a Christian. His heart is filled with love towards you. So even if you fall into very, very, very great sin, terrible sin, all right, what Jesus will do is he'll put his arm around you and he will say, my dear boy, my dear friend, <laughs> okay? You're wishing you didn't sit there. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm so sorry this has happened. You were tempted and you fell into sin. We will put this right. But he will never reject you. Okay, because that is a true friend and Christ is our friend and he's an example to us. They should never be in church judging of each other, rejecting each other, looking down on each other and I'm better than he is, I pray longer or the, his sins are terrible. No, we are friends, we are brothers in the church and we are to love each other unconditionally. The second thing that flows out of that is that Christ, our brother, our friend, supports us throughout our Christian lives. Okay? Before he ascended into heaven, right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, he made a promise. He said, I'm with you till the end of the age. Now Jesus has never failed to keep a promise and he never will fail to keep a promise. If he says, I'm with you till the end of the age, he is with you till the end of the age. You can guarantee that. Okay, whatever you're going through, whatever deep waters you're going through, you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. Okay, I was just sharing uh, with my brother that uh, eight years ago I moved from Africa to this country and my wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died. And I went through depression, a very, very serious depression actually. But I cannot remember a single moment when, when Christ wasn't with me. Okay? The pain is there. That's just, is there. You know, the difficulties are there. Christ is always there. Christ is always there. He supports, he encourages, he blesses, and he sees us through. Now that is Christian friendship. That is Christian brotherhood. Okay, and we need to pray that this is what we will be to each other. We need to pray this, that we as men, we will be brothers to all in the church. The most struggling Christian, the weakest, the most sinful Christian, we need to be there for them, love them unconditionally and support them. I'm rushing because I want discussion. Secondly, the relationship that Christ has with the church, not individual Christians now, but with the church, okay? Ephesians 5, 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. The, the, the New Testament introduces us to our relationship as, uh, with Jesus Christ using a number of illustrations, okay? He is the vine, we are the branches. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep, okay? He is the head, we are the body. He is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. Okay, and this passage, Ephesians 5, 25 to 28, describes the kind of bridegroom that Jesus is to his bride. And there are three things I've pulled out of this passage. First of all, Christ loves his bride exclusively. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, Jesus loves everyone. But I want you to understand this. His love for you as a Christian is different to his love for the unbeliever. He loves the unbeliever. But his love for the Christian is a different love. His love for the church is a different love. It's an exclusive love. 
And the New Testament speaks about this. He speaks about this in John 17, his great high priestly prayer. He prays for the church and he says, I do not pray for the others, I pray for my church, I pray for my people. Uh, so it is an exclusive love. He loves the church. And husbands love your wives. Okay? Uh, I'm talking about adultery. I'm talking about being drift, drifted at, being tempted by adultery. And I'm saying Christ's love for his bride is an exclusive love. Watch yourselves because the world is full of temptation and the devil will come and say, hey, what about this type of life? Well, he loves his church exclusively. Secondly, he loves his church sacrificially. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Gave himself up for her. Okay? If I was in Kenya, uh, I did this once in Kenya and we nearly had a riot. If I had a group of men in Kenya, uh, Kenyan Christians, and I say to them, when you go home, after you've had your evening meal, I want you to do the washing up. I nearly had a riot on my hands. Because in Kenya, men do not do the washing up. That's the women's job. And they said, do you know what will happen to us? Men in the village will laugh at us. <laughs> They will ridicule us, they'll, they'll tease us, and they'll, you, what sort of man are you doing the washing up? What sort of man are you? Men don't do washing up. And I said, yes, but Jesus was willing to be despised. He was willing to be spat at. He was willing to be beaten for his bride. He was willing to be crucified for his bride. He didn't have any dignity, you know, in that last few hours. There was no dignity. He wasn't clinging on to his dignity. He lost all dignity, didn't he? You know, they, 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 they ridiculed him. They placed this crown of thorns on him and this purple robe on him. And they said, prophesy to us. You know, all that that they did to him in the, in the courtroom, in the, in the courtyard, sorry. And then they took him to the cross and they nailed him to the cross. There's no dignity there. Christ gave up all dignity for the sake of his bride. It's a sacrificial love. And men, you need to love your wives sacrificially. Thirdly, it's a pastoral love. Husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. He is in charge of our sanctification. He is in charge of our preparation for heaven. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian 37 years, but I still have sin in me. I still sin. I wish I didn't have to say these things, but it's true of all of us. We still sin because we have the vestiges, the remnant of sin dwelling in us. Sin doesn't rule our lives, but sin is still there, and we fall into sin. And Christ is at work removing sin, purifying us, sanctifying us. And husbands have that role to play because our wives have sin. And it is part of the husband's role as a husband very gently, very graciously to help your wife deal with those sins that are there. That is a love that Christ had for his church. And then the third relationship, Christ the only begotten son of the father. So I'm examining there the role of the father and the role of the son, okay? Now, uh, I, I've quoted the Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 to 10, which speaks about how uh, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews is quite a complicated book and that is quite a complicated passage. We don't need to look at that passage in any great detail. But let me tell you what it is saying. It is saying that it was the father's intention that the son should be the priest of his people. It was the father's intention that the son would sit at his right hand and mediate for his people. Be their priest. And so the son needs to be sympathetic. Okay? The son has to go through what we go through. 
So when the Son was here on earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, when he was here on earth, the Father trained him for Christian ministry. Think about that. The Father trained the Son for his high priestly ministry. Do you know if you go to Christ today and you say to him, I have an anger issue, he will sympathize because he was a human being himself and he's seen what anger does. If you say, I'm watching pornography, he will sympathize because he knows sexual temptation. He underwent sexual temptation, he never sinned, totally sinless, but he was tempted. Okay? He went through every issue. When my wife died, I went to him and I said, you know what it feels like to lose a loved one. There must have been death in your earthly family. You were living with your earthly family there in Nazareth. Your father Joseph was a, a, a carpenter. Your mother Mary was there and your brothers were there. And I think his father died quite early because Joseph is never mentioned in the Gospels. And I think he died when Jesus was possibly in his teens. And I could go to him and I could say to him, you know what it feels like to, to have a death in the family and to lose a loved one. And his heart goes out to all his people when they face trials because he lived here on earth as a human being, experienced all the trials of humanity and the Father trained him to be the high priest of his people. We are to train our children for the ministry of God and his kingdom. Teach your children the scriptures. Be an example to your children in holy living because you want your children to grow up to love the Lord and to serve the Lord. The father trained his son. And then secondly, the son in love obeyed the father in all things. This is what characterized Christ's life, complete obedience, John 6. Okay, and he says to his disciples in John's Gospel, chapter 6, he says, all that the Father has given me, that I will do. He always lived in total obedience to his Father. Now, if you have a father who's still alive, a mother who's still alive, as much as it is possible, do all you can to obey. Uh, my father has died, my mother is a Hindu. And some things she tells me I will happily and joyfully do. But she does say, I don't want you to read the Bible because she's a Hindu, I'm a Christian. Well, I can't obey that. But as far as it is possible for us, live a life of obedience to your parents. Do you know what it says in Ephesians 6? It says, if children obey their parents, this is good in the sight of God. It pleases God. You want to please God, obey your parents. Obviously, God's authority comes above that, but obey your parents. Right. Please contribute, discussion, questions, anything you want to ask. Uh, my motto is there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I mean that seriously, okay? Uh, I've been a pastor 33 years, I've heard everything. So don't worry about asking a stupid question or saying what you'd like to say. But let's try and tease some of these things out. Please uh, do contribute to the discussion. You implied early on that um, being disappointing is being, being disappointing or feeling disappointed isn't actually loving. But um, could you expand on that? What I had in mind is, I think there are people who have this view of Christ that he's always disappointed with them. He's never pleased with them. Because he's a demanding saviour. He's standing there with a stick saying, do, 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 do. And when you don't, he's always disappointed. And that's what I was trying to uh, speak against and say, no, he isn't like that. He's actually sympathetic, compassionate and loving. So we mustn't have that view of Christ. That's what I was trying to uh, elucidate, yeah? Thank you for the question. So if we take that idea further, what do you think about the idea of being accountable to one another? You know, not just accountable to Jesus. Uh, I mean, the co context of the first passage you, you quoted in Mark is that his, mo his, his mother and his brothers have arrived. Yeah. They've been told he's got an unclean spirit and he's doing crazy things. Yes. And, and obviously they're there to hold them to account. Yes. Because they would have held that, that was their role yes. as family mem members. Yes. What do you think that sort of I think, I think it's a hugely, thank you for bringing that, because it is a, a huge part of Christ's ministry. 
that he was accountable. I mean, we see this supremely on the cross when he says to John, behold your mother. Because, you know, he, he cared for her and he wanted her to be taken care of. And obviously, as a son, he was accountable to his father and mother. And you're right, accountability is a huge part of being a man. And it's something we're not very good at. We, we tend to isolate from others because we have things in our lives we don't like to be have opened or challenged. And you're absolutely right. And it's an important part of being a member of a local church. You know, you join a local church, you come under the authority of the leadership and the brethren in the church, and so you are accountable to each other. Very, very important. Thank you for yeah, that. I think we've seen, so, so from, from, from this church, we've seen basically, our, obviously, our men um, kind of stepping out in the last two years, but basically being accountable to everybody in that group. Um, and in theory, as you said, there's no question a stupid question and no matter what is going on in people's lives we're all uh, we're all basically you know if in the on our monday group it's pretty much a free for all to kind of kind of like a you know we're struggling with this can you pray and then we all hold them to account we're basically messaging saying how should we be doing it so we're all um and that's very difficult for men to kind of open up and kind of say look i'm struggling with uh, pornography, or yeah. struggling with um, you know, sexual sin, and yeah. all these things that we've really seen um, and uh, breakthrough um, in people's lives because they're being accountable. And obviously, when people are kind of going, Look, I'm, I want to be accountable to you guys, um, what we also find is the fact that in that week, the enemy has a right pop, <laughs> and basically, like, and we pretty much said, like, this week, because you've basically. Um, let it, all, let it all out and told others uh, this week the enemy is going to try and, and try and try and that's basically what happens but because of somebody and in theory probably a group of 10 uh, standing with that person knowing the fact that someone's praying they can pick up the phone they can do whatever um, we've seen massive breakthroughs uh, just by being accountable and it's really hard for men to kind of go it is with this issue yeah because we kind of want to do it, you know, as, as men, we want to kind of do it our, on our own, and we want to do it uh, our way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like being told, yeah. you don't like being told by others, mm -hmm. kind of, this might be the way that you have to do it um, as well. I agree, but there's also a, a sense of, oh man, why should I be going, I, I should be strong enough to do mm. this, I can do this on my own, yeah. kind of feeling. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's basically one thing that we've, um, as men in, in this church, we we had to kind of really break and be uh, vulnerable to each other, and having the trust um, to kind of go, I'm not going to be seeing any different. If I open up to an issue I've got, they are not going to see me on any on any different. Enough. Well, it's unconditional love, isn't yes. it? I think moreover, the our wives or our partners see that as a strength. Being vulnerable or yeah. being vulnerable to people, being accountable to a select group, knowing that there's um, no leakage, there's, there's, you know, what's, what goes on in that room stays in that yeah. room type thing. Those relationships are really important. Yeah. And being able to, if you explain to, to your wife, I'm, own, I'm part of an accountability group, that seem, I think that seems a strength. Yeah. They see that as different. You know, it's almost like you, you, your your wife would would say would would think. Well, actually, that's a lot more strong than. Not it is. Doing it. It's a sign of strength to say to somebody, "Will you hold me accountable?" Yeah, that's a, it's a, I, I totally agree. It is a sign of strength, isn't it? Because it's saying, "I want to take this seriously." I think it is a weakness to say, I don't want to be accountable to anybody. I want to hide all my weaknesses and so on. You're absolutely right. And I think um, <clears throat> being able to c commit to that is almost sets an example or, or sets you apart. And from, for those wives that are in, say, for instance, can, can recognize that as a step out in faith sees that as a, a stronger example and if you want to do that because <coughs> you want to be a better Christian or a better <coughs> husband, it won't last it, Yeah, and I think, um, yeah. I, th I think one of the things that can make this like, 
what made it really, really sticking for me is the metaphor of warfare. Because if you think of like, oh, going to another man for help, for some men it seems weak, but if you think of like a soldier, and if you're about to fight a war against a whole army, and that's what the kingdom of the yeah, devil is. Absolutely. Army, it's not yeah. just like one person who's affecting yeah. you. Imagine sending one soldier. You know, they're stupid. And yeah. any woman who's, who had a husband who said, I'm a soldier in an army of myself, and I'm going to go and attack <laughs> an, an army, yeah. she's like, OK, I'm married to an idiot. Yes, <laughs> and yes. She's someone who's quite weak. Yes. Yes, whereas if she had a husband who was a soldier, who was part of a regiment, and they all had their uniforms, yeah. then she would be like, OK, this is strength. Yeah. And I, I think that's the way it can be more appealing for men too, because I think men just kind of understand that metaphor. And then it becomes something very obviously of strength to be part of an army that's attacking another army rather than a lone, a lone ranger going up against the whole mm. kingdom of the devil, which is just foolish. Yeah, because so, yeah. yeah. taking that bit, thing on a bit further, do you think then, like, if you're a part of a church and you come with your wife and then you kind of don't get involved in those sort of things, your wife may be thinking, you've got an army here, why are you why are you doing it by yourself? Rather than like if if you said oh, I'm doing it by myself and you, she you never had like a, a army with you anyway, then she doesn't know no different. But she sees that there's clearly a group there, but you're not being part of it. She's even questioning even more then in terms of why are you not getting involved and we, you can build yourself up to build me up and Yeah, and she has every right to ask that question. You know, here is a group of men who can help you, why are you not getting involved and being accountable, absolutely right. I was interested, uh, just going on to the, the husband um, section two, um, is you start from Ephesians 5.25, on purpose obviously, um, because I've just been... You've been reading 22, have you? Why you submit yeah, to your yeah, husband? Yeah. So, just to... As the, as the church submits yeah. to the well, Lord. To your, to your own husband says, uh, as you do to the Lord, Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, uh, of the wife as Christ is the head of the, the church, church. Body, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And then we go into section yeah. 25. Yeah. Now, one thing for me is that that particular verse, 20, uh, 522, um, is one of those things that uh, traditionally it would feature as the verse for a wedding. And what, what frustrated me so much is that they, they stopped before actually telling. They went up to 24 and didn't go on to 25. <laughs> yeah, precisely. That's ridiculous. And, you know, let's just take that out of context, saying, wives, yes. do what you're told. Yes. And, and that's just not the relationship, because then it goes on to say that we are supposed to be to the, to the wife as God was to the church. And, hey, you know, spoiler, he died for us. You know, and if we're to be that example. We need to be told that that's the example. And I think that there's, it's so frustrating that, that um, you know, you're, you're almost told at your wedding that your wife's going to do everything that you tell her to do and then just, you know. But I think the, the husband... I think that's absolutely right. The wife should submit to the... Oh, to that's the, biblical, to, obviously, to yes. The yes. Well, the husband needs to be worthy of the yes. submission. And he is by being sacrificial in his love. Precisely. And I think it's that is not taught. Yeah. And that for me that is very frustrating. Mm. I mm. reckon the wives get away easy on the day. <laughs> oh yeah. Tell you what, yes, we have to love sacrificially. Prepare <laughs> 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 yourself to Christ. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. But if you unpack what it means to be worthy of that submission, it's huge. <laughs> But then, why do we love Christ? Because of what he did for us, isn't it? You know, we love him because he came to this earth and he died for us, you know. And that moves our hearts to love him. And so the wives, if she sees sacrificial love, obviously nowhere near that, but something, okay, obviously that, because the human heart is moved by that sort of sacrificial love. Yeah. yeah it, makes it makes it less hard work the way it is to... Yeah. Be submissive if yes. You are a strong leader. Correct. Sacrificial. Correct. Yes. Yes. I, I, you know, when I deal with a, a marriage marriage problem, 
and it's I'm sorry to say it's usually the man saying she won't do this, she won't yeah. do this, she won't do this, she won't do this. And I begin with him and I say, Well let's leave aside what she won't do. Let's read Ephesians five. And yeah, it, it, it begins to hit home and sometimes they stop coming. The husband says, next session we're not coming. That's happened, sadly. And I think a lot of our, um, a lot of our problems come from not understanding what that worthiness is. You know, it's okay for me to go to a casino and spend all of the, um, you know, the school fund. <laughs> as long as, as long as, you know, the wife does the dishes, because that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, you're not being worthy to that submission. So, you know. Yeah. And that goes for anything. That goes for, um, you know, uh, domestic violence. It goes for, you know, um, being a, uh, an alcoholic. All sorts of things. You know, you've got to be worthy. Mm. And that is really tough. Mm. But it's also important, I think, to notice the way that Jesus exercises his authority. So he calls us friends and brothers. He doesn't call us subjects. No. He doesn't call us slaves. He calls us slaves. He calls us friends but, and brothers. He wants to. You know, but the, what, the, the, <laughs> the beauty... The, the, no. The, the beauty is he wins our loyalty, submission, and service by his love, isn't it? You know, it's when the Spirit of God floods your heart with the love of Jesus. You know, Romans 5, 5, you know, he, the Spirit sheds abroad the love of Christ into your heart. And your, your love is filled, your heart is filled with love from Jesus. He tells you how much he loves you, how precious you are to him. And you just want to do anything for him. You know, you just say, I wish I could love you more because you feel his love. It's his love that wins our, our obedience, isn't it? That's how he does it. He will never bash us into it. If you love me, you will obey me. Exactly. That's it. So it starts with the love. That's it. Then we get on to the That's it. Yeah. yeah. I guess a counterpoint to this would be uh, just the idea of grace in terms of, yeah, men should be aiming towards this ideal but because we're not Jesus, we'll never reach it. So no. a woman can't wait until we actually are. No, no, really. no. They just no. have to wait until we're in relationship to Jesus and yeah. moving closer towards that. Yeah. Otherwise, no woman would ever be obedient. Oh, well, no, of course not. No, you, you know, don't wait till I'm like Christ. Yeah. Yeah. No, but we, we should be growing into yeah. Christ-likeness yeah. more and more. Um, no, you're right. We, we are sinners. We still have sin in us. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, take, taking that point, uh, I think you're right. Um, I think... But you've got to remember that both of you are growing together. Yeah. In gro both of you are growing in that relationship. So you're both terrible at it, and then yeah. five minutes yeah. later, you might be reasonable at it, and then you actually just... I mean, I've been married 17 years, and, you know, we're just about... I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that I was tight and stubborn, we'd be <laughs> <laughs> um, But we've worked through that, and it's that submission and that... Um, learning to submit as well as being worthy of that submission that's got us to the place where we're at. And obviously you've got to be... Yeah, worthy. You know, it's, it's, you know, you, you've got to respect her space and what have you. And there, there, there's boundaries as such, but I think, you can, I think that does. It's way too important yeah. when you consider the other bits, it's almost like the the, the asterisk <laughs> bit at the end, you know. Think, uh, we, we were always told not to take things out of context, but <laughs> don't take things out of context. <laughs> you, you make the woman more willing to submit if the man is more willing to submit towards the Lord. The more we submit and they see that, they would not be I, more willing to... If I can speak from personal experience, my wife submitted to me when I wasn't worthy because she was so godly. Uh, and that's just how it was, you know. There were times when I wasn't godly and she still submitted because she saw that as her duty. You know, she took Ephesians 5.22 very, very seriously. And she promised to submit to me at our wedding and she submitted. And that often hurt and challenged me. So 
I, I, I would never say to a woman in my church, you don't have to submit because he's not worthy. I mean, the command is submit, so you submit. But what we're saying is, let's not make life difficult for our wives. You know, let's be worthy of her submission. Let's, let's make submission a joy, you see? And I think if the husband is sacrificial in love, she will joyfully submit. Yeah. We all fall, we all fall short of the glory of God. That's the main, that's the, the husband and the wife. You know, and there will be times where she won't want to submit because we haven't been worthy or yeah. we've done something. But ultimately, that is what the Bible says. Yeah. But just, just as, just as the Bible says the wife should submit, we need to strive for that worthiness. Yeah. To, for that honour. Yeah. It's this dynamic relationship that works well when both parties play their part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, t uh, Tanya, my wife, will, will, will often say, is, um, you know, I, I love God more than you. You know, jokingly, but that is ultimately what she's called to, to do. You know, first and foremost, we love the Lord. Yeah. With all our heart and soul and, and mind body and strength. And yeah. Yeah. And then I might actually quite fancy you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the bit. And we, we go into that relationship knowing that God is there. Right, I think we've overrun a little bit, but thank you very much for your contributions. It's been very, very helpful. Which way was it to the pub? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cancelled, I'm afraid. <laughs>